Good morning. Welcome to Mount Calvary Church. My name is Ray Stewart. I'm the Connections Pastor here, and we are so thankful that we can worship together this morning. If you are a guest or visitor and haven't introduced yourself to us, we would love to meet you, connect you to the ministries of the church. You can do that with a connection card that's in the seat back in front of you, uh, and you can drop that off uh, either to one of the, the staff members at the welcome desk or in the offering boxes as you leave today. There's also a QR code in front of you. That'll take you to a digital version of the card. It'll also take you to all the signups that we have uh, going on for the ministries of the church. Two um, events that I wanted to draw attention to this morning, uh, where today is the last day to sign up for both of these. One is the marriage equipping class. This is 4.30 to 8.30 next Saturday. Um, we do have child care that's on a donation basis that's supporting our mission trips this summer. Uh, so we would love to have you. Wives, if your husband happens to be on the men's retreat this morning, please feel free to sign up and say, hey, next weekend you're with me. Um, so uh, sign up for the marriage class. Today is the last day. And then our child dedication class. If you want to learn more about why we dedicate children uh, and, and what that means, uh, that is next Sunday morning at 1030. So we do need you to sign up. And then dedication uh, will be May 5th. All right. Good morning. Uh, how many of you, show of hands, had a chance to go outside and view the solar eclipse on Monday? All right. I feel like first service had better participation than that. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, it was it, fascinating to me that it became like all the rage across the country, not even just in the path of totality, but so many people talking about it. And I was just thinking, like, over what? Okay? And it was a God-ordained movement of the earth and the moon in perfect harmony. And I was trying to just figure it out, like, why were people so upset? I mean, it just got a little dark outside, right? Like, why are we so obsessed over this? And my theory, at least one theory uh, as to why people were obsessed with this, is I think we enjoyed feeling small for at least a period of time. And what I mean by that is there's some fun facts this morning that the sun is about 864,400 miles in diameter, which is 109 times the diameter of the earth. So that's kind of mind-blowing. Um, and, uh, um, and that is 400 times the diameter of the moon. Coincidentally, not really coincidentally, that the, moon, or the sun is actually 400 times farther away from the earth than the moon is. And those two facts together, or those, all those facts together, makes the moon and the sun appear to be the same size in the sky. Are you with me? A little science lesson? I'm a math teacher, so I like the numbers part of this. But, uh, and so it, what, what happens is it's, it's an incredible coincidence, right, an astronomical event that we just witnessed where, and people are across the country clapping and cheering as the path of totality comes overhead. And many people I've heard so talk uh, have said, like, well, maybe God's trying to tell us something through this event. And I would be more inclined to just say that he is simply displaying his perfect majesty and glory to us in this moment. Uh, in Psalm 19, verse 1, David was having a moment. And I, I would love to be, like, to know what was David experiencing when he wrote this that you'll see here in a second that, like, what was it? Was it just a dark night where he was looking up and seeing all the, sky, and all the stars? Or maybe it was a solar eclipse. I have no idea. But either way, David is blown away by God's glory being displayed in the heavens as he writes what's in front of you. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And David, in a different psalm, and I'd love to know, like, was this the same night that he wrote this? Psalm 8, 3 and 4, he says this, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Like, big picture, right? Like, how big God is. And then he says this, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? And what a miraculous truth to consider, that as big as God is, and the big as the sun is, and orchestrating the moon and the sun and the stars to have witnessed this event this week, that we can read what David says and feel what David says. Who am I that you would be mindful of me? And this was me this week. I was David. I was listening or reading and thinking through how incredible that our God uh, is all of these things, and how incredible that he, as big as he is, that he's mindful of me, that he would care for me. And so my response is David's response, our response is David's response. We worship, 
that we behold how magnificent and big our God is, and yet in that same way that he cares for you and for me and sent his son to die on the cross on our behalf. And so we give him the praise and the glory that he's due, and so we, and we enjoy being small in the midst of our big God. Let's stand and sing. We'll start with Behold Our God.
seated. And we'll take our time of silent confession. We just sang the truth of the good news of the gospel that we were lost and we were dead and we were running from God in our sin and yet he came and rescued us. And so each week we take time to consider that and consider if there's sin today that we need to make right before God and we rejoice that he is all that we have and that life is only found through him and through what he's done for us on the cross. So take a few minutes to do that and then we'll continue to sing. Let's stand and uh, again just rejoice that, that, you know, as Christ has forgiven us, we now give him uh, our lives and give him everything. He came from glory, he took on flesh to save and lost the grace and mercy. Displayed upon the cross our redemption. He's the hope for all mankind, one name over everything. One name over Yeah. 
Okay, kids, you are dismissed to Fusion and Fusion Plus. That's our children's ministry for those in grades kindergarten to fifth grade. Parents, feel free to walk over to the other building, and um, you'll see where you can pick them up after the service. And so we come to our time of giving today, and just a reminder that giving is a form of worship. It's our opportunity to give back to God just a little bit of what he has given to us. We do have offering boxes in the back where you can place your, your gifts each week. You can also give online um, as well. And so at Mount Calvary Church, we, be, we believe that God has called everyone to passionately pursue Christ. And we do that by becoming a disciple, growing as a disciple, and going and making disciples. And your faithful giving each week helps us to help you passionately pursue Christ. And one of the ways that we do that is helping you grow as a disciple. And we do that through a variety of ways, one of which is our classes. We have different types of classes. We have equipping classes. These are like one-off types of um, um, instruction we, that happened like a couple weeks ago. We had our place class this Saturday, April 20th. We're having a marriage equipping class. This is an opportunity for you to learn how to honor God in your marriage, be intentional in your marriage. Um, today is the last day to sign up for that. So if you haven't already, um, you can sign up. You can sign up online. You can see uh, Pastor Ray or Morgan. Um, the other kind of class that we offer here is a Bible class. This is on Sunday mornings. We have some that meet at 9 a.m. We have some that meet at 1030. Um, but um, these are ways that we can help you grow as a disciple and passionately pursue Christ. So let's pray now. We're going to pray for our classes and we're going to thank God for our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the abundant blessings that you give us each week. We thank you that we can be here together today to worship you. And Lord, we thank you for the faithful giving of our people. Lord, um, help us to uh, use these gifts to passionately pursue you. And Lord, um, with, we thank you for our classes that we are able to offer. Father, I pray that you would just give us wisdom as to the types of classes that we offer, how we can best equip and encourage our people here um, through these classes. Lord, we want to be able to offer more things in the fall, and, show, and so show us how we can do that. Lord, I pray that you would raise up leaders um, for our classes. Lord, bring us teachers. Um, God, just, we just thank you. We love you, Lord. Um, we thank you that we can passionately pursue you week after week, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Mount Calvary Church. My name is Jonathan Weber. I'm one of the pastors here. And whether this is your first time here or you've been here 20 years, we're grateful uh, that you've chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us as we uh, look to God and look to his uh, son, Jesus, our Savior, and an opportunity to focus on him as we look to his word this morning. And uh, so if you have uh, your Bibles with me this morning, turn to Acts chapter 7. Uh, we've been making our way through the book of Acts on Sunday mornings, and this morning we're going to try to attempt to make our way through 60 verses. And so for you podcast listeners out there, that means we're going to go at one and a half speed this morning. So, uh, uh, but seriously, uh, I encourage you to open your Bibles. We're going to look at a lot of Scripture. We're going to read through uh, these verses and kind of point out some, uh, some important things. So I encourage you to do that. And as we begin, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been accused of doing something by someone else when they're the ones that are actually doing it? Uh, this happens frequently. It's called projection. When others accuse you of doing something that they're actually doing to deflect blame or avoid accountability, and I see this regularly in my kids. I don't know if you do. Uh, Wesley is about 14 and 10 years younger than Haley and Zachary. And so my older kids, they're at a more independent stage of their life than he is currently. And, and that provides some, uh, some benefit uh, uh, with some impromptu uh, runs for slushies or Wendy's runs when uh, they all pile in the car and head across town to go get a treat. He loves that. But it also is boring when he's begging them, would you please play with me? Please play with me. And when he does that, they usually respond in one of two ways. 
usually they say, uh, sometimes they say, you know what, I'm really busy, maybe later, not right now. Or sometimes they say, okay, what do you want to do? And they agree to play a game with him or do something with him. And sometimes when that happens, it doesn't exactly go the way that he wants it to go. Him and his big brother play uh, Nerf basketball. And guess who loses all the time? And when it doesn't go the way uh, that, it, uh, that he wants it to go, our youngest often responds in anger, with harsh words, and, and unkind actions to his siblings. I know it never happens at your house, just our house, but, uh, but that's often what happens. And then Dane and I hear the age-old complaint, Mom, Dad, my brother, my sister, they're being mean to me. When in all reality, he's the one being mean. He's the one that said unkind words. He's the one that's got upset and started swinging at his brother. Uh, And this happens often with brothers and sisters. And I don't think it's just a phenomenon in the Whitmer household. I think you've probably experienced it growing up if you had brothers and sisters. And if you have kids, it probably happens at your house too. Well, in our text today, we see the Jews are projecting. They're accusing Stephen of something that they're actually doing themselves. And in Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 1 begins with a question that the high priest asked Stephen. And here's the question. Are these things so? Kind of a weird way to start a chapter. Are these things so? And it makes us wonder, what in the world? What in the world are they talking about? In order to understand kind of where we are in chapter 7, we need to go back to the last part of chapter 6. And last week, Pastor Matt started chapter 6, and he told us that uh, that the church in Acts is growing as both Hebraic and Hellenistic Jews have responded to the gospel and put their faith in Jesus. And so as their numbers grew, so did their needs, right? And the Hellenistic Jews came to the apostles, and they complained. They said, hey, our widows are being overlooked. They're not being cared for. And the apostles recognized that their first priority was to preach the gospel, so they came up with a solution. They chose seven men, including Stephen, to kind of go and meet the needs of the widows and take care of their physical needs. So Luke introduces us to Stephen in chapter 6, and we're not told a whole lot about him. In verse 3, it says he was full of the Spirit and wisdom. In verse 5, it says he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And if we pick up in verse 7, we learn a little bit more about Stephen. Look at verse 7 in chapter 6. The word of the Lord continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking. So here in the end of chapter 6, we see that the apostles continue to be focused on preaching the gospel. They're sharing the gospel, and many people came to faith, including who? Jewish priests. They came to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And in verse 8, we see Stephen's service has grown beyond just meeting physical needs to now focus on spiritual needs. He's now involved in a more apostolic ministry like the other apostles. And it says he is doing great wonders and signs among the people. He's the first person in the New Testament that's not an apostle. That's actually God empowers to do miracles. This is Stephen. And throughout the book of Acts, we see God empowering the the apostles to do miracles, to do signs and wonders. And these observable and indisputable deeds authenticate both the ministry and the message of the apostles. In case after case, people believe the message that was confirmed by miracles. In verse 11, we see, Then they, the Jews, secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him, Stephen, speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, and they seized him and brought him before the council. 
And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Stephen goes from being selected to serve, and now he's seized and slandered. Stephen's teaching was not well received by the Jews. He was full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit, and he was communicating and teaching, and he was not well received. And they falsely accuse him of blasphemy. Blasphemy was simply speaking evil about something that God deems sacred. It's speaking false or malicious words about or against God or anyone associated with God and his power and his plan. It was synonymous with irreverence for and a disrespect towards God. And it was a serious accusation that was punishable by death. Stephen's in a little bit of trouble here. He's been a bold witness for Jesus, and now that's gotten him, in, uh, in, with, in, him into trouble with the Jews. And so now we see in our passage that the Jews, they secretly instigated, they secretly planted false witnesses against Stephen. And that sounds familiar, doesn't it? They did the same thing with Jesus. And now they're doing it to his apostles, to those following after Jesus. For both the false accusations and arrests, it's, it's safe to assume that Jesus, that Stephen was boldly proclaiming Jesus, and the Jews didn't like it. And it made sense. It made sense because it went against, it was a threat to their Old Testament law and their religious system. They didn't see uh, Jesus as, as, as the truth and the true Savior, the one who fulfilled the Old Testament law. And so when the high priest asked Stephen, is this so? They're asking him, hey, have you been guilty of blaspheming against God? And Stephen answers the high priest. And it's not a short answer. In verses 2 through 53, he gives them his answer. It's his sermon. It's his sermon. And in this sermon uh, response to the Jews, Stephen is far from being blasphemous, but he skillfully walks through Jewish history. Skillfully explaining how all throughout their history, it's been pointing to Jesus. God's been pointing to Jesus all throughout their history. So Stephen answers their question and false accusations, and he gives them this long sermon. And we don't have time to do a deep dive into every point or every part of this sermon, but I want us to focus on one main theme, one important theme that that Stephen highlights over and over again as he's preaching to these Jews. He's exposing their religious pride. He's pointing out their religious pride. As he goes through their history, he's pointing out their religious pride. The Jews viewed themselves as spiritually elite, and it caused them to be self-righteous and conceited. And they were mistaken, mistakenly confident in their perceived position before God. And our Kent Hughes says in his commentary on Acts, he said, Stephen knew his Bible, and he knew his Bible history. And as he stood tall before the council, he brought the theology of Christ down hard on the three great pillars of Judaism, the law the land, and the temple. Three false bases for confidence before God. And these three great pillars that Stephen goes through are all sources of religious pride for the Jews. So let's first of all look at the religious pride that comes from living, living in the land. A popular Jewish thought uh, was that God gave special privileges to those living in the land of Palestine, the Holy Land, the land that God promised. And Stephen argues with them that, hey, this is a wrong belief by accurately walking through the Old Testament history, the examples of Abraham, the examples of Joseph and his brothers, and the example of Moses. So let's look at Abraham in verses 2 through 8 in chapter 7. And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. It's a very kind, respectful way that he responds. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham When he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. And then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and he lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you're now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but he promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. 
And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners in the land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Stephen starts with Abraham. He starts with God's promise to Abraham that, that he would give his people a land. And he clearly points out that God revealed himself to Abraham before he was actually in the land. God appeared to him before he was actually in the land. Stephen says, hey, God blessed Abraham even though he didn't actually own a foot of the promised land. And God's blessing on Abraham was based not on his real estate, but it was based on his relationship with God. Genesis 15, 6 tells us, and he, Abraham, believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. It doesn't say this about Abraham in that verse. It doesn't say, and he lived in the promised land and it counted to him as righteousness. See, God appeared to Abraham before he was in the land. He blessed him before he was in the land. So that's the example of Abraham. He goes on to the example of Joseph and his brothers in verses 9 to 16. Stephen says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and her fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem in the land and laid in a tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. Stephen moves on, and he focuses on Joseph and his 11 brothers. We know that his brothers were jealous of Joseph. And in Genesis 37, we see this kind of sibling rival. We know that Stinkin' Joseph had that special coat, that coat that none of his other brothers had, that, 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 that colorful coat that he wore all the time that just reminded them that he was dad's favorite. It bothered them. It got under their skin. So the brothers took matters in their own hands, and what they do? They sold Joseph off into Egypt. And if God's favor was tied to living in the land, then God must have forgotten Joseph, Right? He was forgotten. Wrong. Stephen tells us that when Joseph was in the foreign land of Egypt, what? God was with him. God was with him. God was working in his, in his life. God was using him. He grew in favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh made him ruler over all of Egypt and all of his household. Meanwhile, things aren't going too well back in the promised land, are they? They're starving. They have no food. Famine has hit and they're desperate. And Jacob learns that there's food in, in Egypt, and so he sends the brothers down to Egypt, and they're reunited with Joseph, and Joseph reveals himself, and Joseph invites them, the whole family, to come down and provides the place for them to live and provides food for them. Joseph and his family experienced God's blessing in Egypt. They were in Egypt, not when they were living in the promised land. And finally, Stephen focuses on Moses, verses 17 to 36. And he spends a lot of time on Moses because he knows. He knows the Jews love Moses. Moses was their guy. He was, he was the main figure in the Old Testament. He was the one that God gave the law to. And so Stephen gives a brief overview of the 120 years life of Moses here in these verses. In verses 17 to 22, it focuses... But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted Abraham, the people, Israelites, increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. And he dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born. and He was beautiful in God's sight. 
And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in words and deeds. Stephen's talking about Exodus 2. And Exodus 2 tells us, hey, it's a bad time in Egypt when Moses is born. Joseph has died. He's, and, and, and the new Pharaoh doesn't recognize uh, the Israelites and, 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 and deals with them harshly. Says that they, looking at the size of the Israelites, they're threatened. And so what do they do? They enslave them and put them to slave labor. And they decide, you know what? Their size is too great. We're going to kill every baby boy born to the Israelites. Yet God protected Moses in Egypt. He was born, and his mom got to nurse him for three months. And then, his, then Pharaoh's daughter adopted him. He grew up in privilege in the palace. He was, he was educated. He had access to the best education. These helped Moses develop into a great leader, wise in words and deeds. That was his first 40 years. And then in verses 23 to 29, we see the next 40 years of his life. And when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged, his, avenged him by striking down the Egyptians. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hands. But they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now we see Moses is 40. When his heart turned to his fellow, to fellow Hebrews, he saw their suffering. He had a heart for them. He wanted to try to help them. And he went to visit the people of Israel says he's desired to save them from their situation. And there he witnessed an Egyptian being beaten by an Israelite. And he looks around, he decides to step in and stop it, and eventually kills that Egyptian. And the next day he returns and he finds two Hebrews, and they're arguing with one another. He tries to step in and settle the argument. And he's pushed aside, and one bluntly says, hey, mind your own business. Who made you ruler and judge over us? So you're going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? The news of Moses' murder had spread among the Israelites and eventually made its way to Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh found out, he wanted to kill Moses, and so Moses ran for the hills. He went to Midian. And Stephen tells us that Moses was in Midian for 40 years, living a quiet and simple life, a life of a shepherd. He got married, and he had two kids. Moses left Egypt. And then in verses 30 to 36, it focuses on the last 40 years of Moses' life. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. As he drew near to look, there came a voice from the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob, and Moses trembled and, and did not dare to look. And then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groaning, and I've come down to deliver them. And now I come, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. And then this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. When Moses was 80, God called him from the burning bush on Mount Sinai in the wilderness. And there the angel of the Lord is calling to Moses to go back to Egypt to deliver and rescue them and lead them in the exodus. And Moses obeys, and he leads the people out of Egypt and through the wilderness for 40 years. But notice what Stephen said in verse 33 about Moses. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy 
ground. Jews thought the promised land was holy ground. But here we see holy grounds wherever God meets with his people. It's not just limited to the physical land of Palestine, the promised land. Holy grounds wherever God meets with his people. And throughout the life of Moses, we see God's greatest miracles that Israel experienced when God met with them and delivered them and helped them. It was outside the land of Israel. The 10 plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, God providing for them in their wilderness with water and quail and manna. It's clear from the examples of Abraham, the examples of Joseph, and the examples of Moses that God meets and takes care of his people wherever they are. It doesn't matter what land they're living in. God meets with them. And so here, Stephen's calling out the Jews' religious pride, and he says, hey, you know what? Living in the land, living in the promised land, it's not proof of God's favor or a personal faith in Jesus. It's not proof of that. Your confidence before God shouldn't be based on a location. It's based on a Savior. And Stephen was trying to tell them about the Savior. Stephen goes on and he says, hey, religious pride, your religious pride, uh, this false religious pride, you don't get it from, from the law. Look at verse 37. This is Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us, and our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, and Aaron, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the hosts of heaven, as is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Molech and the star of your God, Rephim, and the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Again, Stephen said, hey, another source of Jewish uh, false religious pride is the fact that God met with Moses on Mount Sinai, gave him the law, gave him the Ten Commandments, gave him those two tablets. It was a source of their, of their religious pride. And unfortunately, they valued being given the law more than they really valued understanding the law. They didn't understand the law. They didn't understand the purpose of the law. And Stephen reviews how God met with Moses on the mountain, he gives him the Ten Commandments, and he calls it living oracles. It's living oracles. Living oracles, not just the Old Testament law, but it's, New Test it's our New Testament scriptures, all of scriptures. It's alive and active and able to change our hearts and change our lives. He says, we've given you the living oracles, and then he reminds them, even before Moses got down the mountain, what were you doing? You turned your back on God. You had Aaron make a calf for you to worship. You got impatient, and you went and worshiped off after idols. And Stephen quotes from the minor prophet Amos in Amos 5, condemning the Israelites for going through their religious motions, offering sacrifices to God when they were actually worshiping God, other gods in their hearts and with their lives. The law of Moses couldn't save the Israelites, and it can't save us because we can't keep it. We can't obey it. The law exposes our sin and shows us our need for a Savior. That's what the law is for. And Stephen even quotes the Old Testament law in Acts 7.37. He's quoting Deuteronomy 18.15 when Moses says, hey, I'm gonna, that God's going to send another prophet like me, and that prophet is Jesus. It's Jesus to save them from their sins. Who by faith once and for all could forgive their sin and restore their relationship with God. Again, Stephen calls out the Jewish religious pride and says, hey, being given the law, it's not proof it's not proof of God's favor or personal faith in Jesus. And your confidence before God shouldn't be based on simply having the law. And finally, he exposes their religious pride based on landmarks. The Jewish people loved their landmarks. Look at verse 44. It says, Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn 
brought it with Joshua when they disposed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked for, to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? And in these verses, Stephen again looks through the history of, of, of Israel. And he talks about, hey, you know, Moses. Moses was instructed to build the tabernacle this traveling tabernacle they had with them in the wilderness. And when Joshua entered in the promised land, and it was, a, it was a picture of God meeting with them. It was where they went to meet with God. And so they had the tabernacle. And then it talks about David's desire to build God a permanent house. You know, he wanted a, God to have a permanent house, not just this tabernacle they, they took down and, and set up. He wanted to have a permanent house. And said God directed Solomon to build that temple. And again, we see that the Jews had, the, had, had religious pride because they think they had these special privileges because they, they had these special places where they would go and meet with God, these landmarks, the temple and the tabernacle. And these were significant structures. They were meant to be significant structures. They were meant to be a place where they could come and worship, a holy place. But Stephen shares an important truth in verse 40, 48 that I think we all need to see. The all-powerful, ever-present God of the universe is not limited to a single place or space. He's not limited to a single place or space, and he quotes Isaiah 66 to reinforce the truth. Does the, does the, the Most High God dwell in a house made by man? No, he's created everything. He's, he, he's, he can be anywhere. He doesn't need just to be in a special te temple or tabernacle. God's a pilgrim God. He met with Abraham, right, when he was in Mesopotamia. He met with, with Joseph in Egypt. He met with Moses in, in Midian. And guess what? He meets with us wherever we are. We can call on him, and he'll meet with us. We don't have to be at a special place. He's a pilgrim God. One final time, Stephen calls out their pride, saying, hey, your landmarks, they're not proof of God's favor or personal faith in Jesus. And your confidence before God shouldn't be based on a building shouldn't be based on a building. And the false elevation of the land and the law and landmarks, thinking they provided some salvific benefit or spiritual blessing, it confused the Jews. It confused, it clouded their understanding that they were sinners in need of a savior. It clouded their understanding that Jesus came to save them. He was the Messiah. He was the one that they needed to put their faith and trust in. And Stephen concludes his sermon in verses 50 to 53. And he says, hey, you know, Jews, your arrogance, your, your religious pride, because of that, you historically, you historically persecuted and rejected and killed the Old Testament prophets who God sent to point you to the Messiah, to the Savior. You rejected them and even killed them. But now Jesus had come. Jesus had come to earth. He had come and ministered. And he went to the cross and he died. And he rose again and went back to heaven. And the church is born, and the apostles are, are sharing the good news of the gospel. And Stephen stands before the 71 Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin, and he says, but you're without excuse. You're without excuse. You've seen Jesus, you've heard Jesus, and you rejected him. You murdered him. You killed him. You murdered the righteous one. The righteous one was a, is, is a title for Jesus. It's used here and two other times in Scripture. And Stephen says, you're without excuse. You've seen Jesus. You've heard him. You rejected and killed him. And with that, Stephen's sermon is over. Stephen's sermon is over. But I think it's clear through this long and thorough sermon that Stephen shows that the Jews viewed themselves as a spiritual elite. Clearly reveals that they were self-righteous and conceited, that they were full of religious pride with a, a false confidence in their position before God. And the question for us is, well, how does that apply to us today? And the truth is, if we're not careful, we can too be just like the Jews that Stephen was communicating with. 
Let's think about the land. Hey, I live in the United States of America. It's a land that was founded by Christians on, uh, uh, with Christian principles. It's a land where I get to have the freedom to worship God, and I am grateful. I'm grateful that we live in a land where we can worship God. I'm grateful that we have peop- many, many people that have, uh, have served and fought to protect that freedom. But it's easy for us to believe that because I live in this nation, that I'm good with God. That I'm good with God. That after all, it's a, America's a Christian nation, and everyone who lives there is Christians, right? How about the law? Well, I got three Bibles, and one of them is a study Bible, and I got the U version app on my phone that I, that I read regularly. And it's easy for us to believe that because we have all these different versions of the Bible and all these different copies of the Bible, that I'm good with God, right? Or how about the, a landmark? Hey, I go to church or a youth group. Every Sunday. I'm regularly involved in ministry. Uh, I, I serve in leadership. Uh, it's, it's easy for us to believe that, hey, because I show up here at 625 North Holly Street or 45 Veterans Drive week after week after week, I'm good with God. And all of those things are great things. All of those things are important things. And all of those things are not proof of God's favor our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We can live in the United States. We can have multiple copies of a, of, of a Bible. We can go to church day after day, week after week, and we could still be lost in our sin like the Jews that Stephen was preaching to here in Acts 7. The land, the law, and the landmarks, they couldn't save the Jews, and they can't save us today. They can't save us from our sin and our rebellion against God. Can't. And Stephen's message to the Jews of his day and for us today is simply this. It's Jesus, only Jesus. It's Jesus, only Jesus. He says, hey, you've seen Jesus. You've heard Jesus. You're without excuse. You betrayed and murdered him. They heard Peter boldly proclaim a little bit earlier in Acts, in Acts 4.12, and there is is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. It's Jesus, only Jesus. Only a personal faith and trust in Jesus can rescue us from our sin and reconcile our relationship with God. It's not about a land. It's not about a landmark. It's not about a law. It's about a relationship. It's about our faith and trust in Jesus. And the message of the first church in Acts and our church today is this. It's Jesus, only Jesus. And I hope that you recognize as you came in this morning, as we sang our songs this morning, as you show up week after week after week, we sing songs about Jesus. We point people to Jesus. We, we, we look through God's word and look how it points to Jesus because we all need a savior. We can't save ourselves. We can't do enough good things. We need a savior. We need Jesus. It's Jesus, only Jesus. And our only confidence comes from our faith in Jesus, not our actions or activities. It only comes from Jesus. And the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it saves us from our sin and from religious pride, and it cultivates a spirit of dependence and a spirit of humility, recognizing there's nothing good about me, that without Jesus, I am lost, and I need him every day. I need him to help me, to help me live for him, to help me obey him, to help me tell others about him. It's Jesus, only Jesus. I've been a Christian a long time. I got saved when I was four or five years old. And the longer we are as Christians, it's easy to get prideful. It's easy to get th- to thinking that, you know what, I got it all figured out. I'm good with God. I go to church, I read my Bible, and it's easy to lose focus on the one that we need to be focused on. Jesus, only Jesus. Our church exists to make, uh, uh, to make people followers of Jesus Christ, to passionately pursue Jesus. So if you're here today and you never put your faith and trust in Jesus, we'd love to talk to you about it. It's the most important decision that you can make. Today's the day. There's no, today's the day. Don't wait. We'd love to talk to you about it. And if you do know Jesus, are we following him? Are we kind of living high on the, the religious pride? Like, hey, you know what? I'm good. I read my Bible. I serve here, I serve there, I go to church, I'm good. No, are we following Jesus faithfully with our everyday lives? Are we, look, are we looking for opportunities to, to point other people to Jesus? Stephen did that. Stephen did that in this long sermon. It's the only sermon that we know of Stephen. 
And we'll see next week it didn't turn out real well with him. But this one sermon of Stephen had a lasting impact on our world. Without this sermon of Stephen, it's safe to say that, you know, we as, as non-Jewish people may not have ever heard the gospel. But God used Stephen, what, to save Paul. And Paul brought the gospel to the Gentiles. And because of that, we have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mount Calvary Church is about one thing. It's about Jesus. You show up here on Sunday morning, we're going to sing about him. We're going to read God's word and point to him. We're going to preach about him. That's who we are. Because we need him. I need him. I need him to rescue from my, me from my pride and recognize without him I am nothing and nobody. I need his strength. I need his power. It's Jesus only Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to open it this morning. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you that in spite of our sin, in spite of our rebellion, you didn't give up on us. And you sent Jesus to be our Savior. And we're grateful for your word that points to your Son and the hope that we can have in him. And so, Lord, today I pray that everyone in this room is examine their lives, would realize their need for you and put their faith and trust in you. And if there's any here that haven't done that, Lord, I pray today that would be the day of their salvation. I pray that they would ask uh, who they came with or, and, and about how they can know you. And Lord, for those of us here who do know you, who may have known you a long time, forgive us when we get full of pride. Forgive us when we think, you know what, we've arrived. You know what, we're, we're all right. We read our Bible. We go to church. We serve. Forgive us for, for losing sight of the fact that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves each and every day. We need to recognize that without you, we're lost. Without your power, without your help, we are nothing. And, and, and Lord, help us to, uh, to live our lives that honor you. Father, we're grateful. We're grateful that, that your word, the Old Testament and the New Testament, points all to Jesus, our Savior. I pray that we live lives that honor him today in your name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll close singing those exact words, Jesus, only Jesus. Who has the power to raise the dead and who can say us from our sin, He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. And who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King Almighty, Lord, saints and angels, all adore I join 
Jesus, only Jesus may be the focus of our lives, the focus of our church. And Ephesians 3, 20, 21, Paul tells us how we can do that. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next week.